book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Put on, then, the full armor of God. How many times have you heard a sermon on this text? Probably a few times. I think it's been a while since I've heard a sermon on it, and I know I haven't preached on it ever, and so I'm excited to to do so today. But as, as I think of this text, it seems to me like I've heard this taught a few different ways, and none of them really put our focus and trust on Jesus. So my prayer today, as we consider the armor of God as as uh, something that God has given to us, that this would indeed point us to Jesus Christ, our Savior, God's champion, his mighty warrior, and that we would be comforted by it. These past three weeks have been fun, as at least for me, maybe for you too, I hope, as we've gone through basically the second half of the book of Ephesians. This is kind of how our lectionary works, is in the Gospels you get selected readings. They usually match up really tightly with the Old Testament and the the epistles, though. Sometimes they'll just kind of go right through an epistle lesson. And so there's not necessarily a really strong theme throughout all the texts this week, but but we're going to do our best to try to see what's there as we consider this chapter. One of my favorite ways to read through a book is I've well, read this passage probably a number of times. You've read through the creation account a few times. You probably have read about Jesus healing that nobleman's son a few times. One of my favorite things to do is I read God's word, and I encourage you to do is to look for a different theme each time. And you can do this um, by thinking of just different things that are going on, perhaps. Reading through the Genesis account, you, you consider what it, the, the darkness and the light and the theme that carries on throughout all of Scripture. So when you come to Ephesians, you can be thinking about darkness and light, and that will bring new illumination to you as you understand the Scriptures. But one of my favorite ways, one of my favorite themes to follow throughout Scripture is, is warfare. God's warfare. That God is a God of war. And indeed, in Scripture, we see that there is such a thing as holy war, though probably not in the sense of what we sometimes think of it, but holy war, war that God is engaged in. We see that this theme begins all the way back in Genesis 3 when when God promises Eve that her descendants, her seed, would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. This is violent. This is warfare between the serpent and the seed of Eve. And we see this theme throughout the Old Testament, but we also see it in the New Testament. It's not as if God in the Old Testament is a God of war. No, in the New Testament, all of a sudden he's this God of peace. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not just in the beginning God, it's also in the end God. And in the middle it's God as well. And so this God of war that we see in our text today, as he's talking about his armor, is the God who, who is here with us today as we gather together and as we hear his word. Our epistle reading today, the armor of God, is a great example of this theme in the New Testament. The section begins with a word that just simply is finally. Paul is telling us this is the end, and similar to how sermons will sometimes come with a finally, in the middle or towards the end, but this one, this is really a true finally. This is the epilogue. This is the summary of everything that Paul has taught in this letter 
with some imagery of God's armor added to it. There's really no new teaching in here. It's just repackaged and fit for battle. The war is real. In verse 12, the, the, Paul characterizes this war between God and his evil foe, the devil, as a spiritual battle, a battle between light and darkness, a battle between good and evil. The devil and his hosts lined up on one side and God and his hosts line up on the other. Now, I want to do my best to present this text as clearly as the text allows. Sometimes it's easy for us to dismiss things that are only spiritual. We see this happen all the time in our culture, but even in our churches, as we deny, the, even in some churches, deny the spiritual presence of God as he gathers together with the saints, or when Jesus says, this is my body, that we, we would see that this is true because he's present here with us. I think this is something that is born out of maybe disbelief or, or apathy, or perhaps it's just a, a post-Renaissance skepticism of anything that is intangible. We confess that we believe that God has made things that are invisible. In the Nicene Creed, we say that, that God, that our Heavenly Father, is the creator of, all, of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. That there are things that are intangible. And that included in that is, is you, by the way. You are not just a clump of atoms who is able to have cognitive of of. of understandings and and able to think and perceive things around you you are more than that you are both body and spirit that there there is something about humans specifically that goes beyond this physical existence that we can see feel touch and smell that that god god made mankind men women children in his own image and we have eternal souls, that this is what it means to be human. It says, and, and we confess this not just in, in like the Nicene Creed, but also in our liturgy as we, we do the Lord's, or the Lord, have the Lord's Supper. When I say, the Lord be with you, what do you respond with? And with your spirit, that's right. And with your spirit. So this is a truth that we confess every week in church, and yet, Sometimes we have hard times with this. And when I say we, I definitely mean me because I have felt that type of of doubt at times and I have scoffed at the idea of anything that's spiritual in my life. But, But we know that this is true because God says that it is true. He tells us in his word that it is true. And this has major implications for us as we consider what it means to not only be human, but as what it means to be Christians in this life. The reality of the spiritual realm and the battle that takes place there is revealed to us very clearly throughout scriptures. There is an awareness of the spiritual realm outside of scripture, and you see this as if you ever talk with missionaries who are in places outside of kind of like the northwestern hemisphere, whether you're in Africa or if you're in South America or in Asia, there's no denial of it. It's, it's there. They, they, they see that clearly. But it's here in Scripture where we see it very clearly revealed for what it is, that it is a battle, a battle between God and the devil. If your first reaction to scoff at this is like what mine has been, know this, that Scripture isn't, couldn't be any more clear on the subject that it really does exist. So what are we to do if we're in the midst of a spiritual battle? That's the question. That's the question for us as we think about the armor of God. What what do we do? What are we to think? What are we to believe? Paul gives us the orders, and he does so in commands. And he uses the imagery that uh, a Roman soldier would understand with armor. And actually, it wouldn't just be soldiers. It would be pretty much anybody in Corinth, Anybody in Ephesus? Anybody in Jerusalem? Because Roman soldiers were everywhere. First, the first thing he tells us is in verse 10. He says, be strong. Or if, to tease out the meaning there, it's be made strong. How? In the Lord. The strength that you need for the battle, 
the spiritual battle, the real battle that's going on, that's raging throughout the cosmos, is to be strong with the strength that God will give you and in his might. It's God's strength. It's God's gift to give you his strength. He supplies you with this strength through his word. This is similar to the command that the Lord gave to Joshua. Think back to Joshua chapter one, when he said, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua and the host of Israel looked up and they saw flesh and blood and they saw mighty stone walls before them in the city of Jericho and across all of the land that was promised to them. And it's easy to think, well, this is a battle of flesh and blood. But God says, no, this is a spiritual battle. When the battle is a spiritual battle, you rely on spiritual weapons. And we see that demonstrated in the story of Joshua and Israel fighting against Jericho. In the Old Testament, the people of God were externally organized in that way. They were the nation of Israel. They were centered around the judges and then later on the kings And they had their own rules and they had their laws that they had to follow. They had laws that regarded the way how they worshiped and how they interacted with one another and about how to act morally. And we see those in the Ten Commandments. And so in this external organization as a nation, when when Israel crossed the, the Jordan River to go to battle, it wasn't just Israel crossing the river to go to battle, it was God. It was Yahweh crossing the river with his people to go to battle against the false idols of the Canaanites. That's what the battle was. That's what the battle is. Paul talks about what this means Because as we think about Israel, well, well, was everybody in Israel really believing? No. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says in Romans 9, for all all who are descended from Israel do not belong to Israel. It's only those who are children of the promise. Or Galatians 3, 7 says it this way. It says, no then, it's those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And so as the sons of Abraham, we are to believe in the promises that God gave to Abraham and to his descendants after him and to his his ancestors before him, thinking of Adam and Eve and Seth and Shem and all these other great names throughout the Old Testament that we've been learning about in confirmation, right? That, That God gave these promises to them and it's those who believe in the promises of God who are counted amongst God's people. The second thing that we're to do, the first was to be made strong in the Lord. The second thing we're to do is to take up the whole armor of God. This means simply to believe, and that is what Paul is talking about when he says it is those of faith who are are the sons of Abraham. God promised Adam and Eve in the garden to crush the head of the serpent. God promised Abraham to make a great nation out of him, to give him rest and bless him immensely. God promised Israel to make a new covenant with them, to give them a new heart, a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone, to send an anointed one and to wipe away their sins. The Old Testament believers in this promise looked forward to the coming of the anointed one, the Messiah. That's what anointed one means. The Christ, that's what it is in Greek. They looked forward to the Christ in order to fulfill these promises. These Christians are the same as you and me. The difference between you and Abraham or you and David is that we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed because we live on this side of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And so we have all the more reason in that sense to believe, not only because God has said that he would do these things, but because Jesus Christ came in history. He lived and he walked amongst human beings like you and me, and he died and he rose again and ascended to heaven. As a member of the church universal, the one holy church, the una sanctum sometimes we'll see in old theology books, or what we sometimes see when we confess creeds with a, when we say the holy Catholic church, and it's in a little c because we're not Roman Catholics. We're Lutherans. We're Christians. That's what we are. But we belong to this church that's bigger than us, 
And as a member of this church, you are outfitted with the armor of God. This is what God gives to us. This armor of God that God gives to us means that that God not only gives it to us, but that he is the creator of it and he's the provider of it. And indeed, it's the armor that he wears. This gift is for you. It's not a shopping list. This isn't a, a checklist you must fill out as if you're maybe filling out a list of things that you need to get done on Saturday before you show up to church or on Sunday morning. This is an inventory. These are the things that you have. This armor of God's is yours now. There is a helpful line of thinking for us as we understand how this armor comes to us because this, really, this is really the question. It's really, it's really the, the thing that is a miracle in this text that this armor of God is yours. God bestows his armor on his people as a gift through his son, Jesus Christ. And as you think about this, it's helpful to think back into the Old Testament, how Christ is described. In Isaiah, Jesus is depicted as God's champion. He's depicted as a champion fitted out with with armor and with a rod and a sword. And this sword is is not a little small sword, it's it's a big sword. And when he strikes the ground, the whole earth shakes. This is how Jesus is depicted. The same imagery is used of Jesus in the book of Revelation. When when Jesus comes at the end of this age, it says that a sword will protrude from his mouth and the sword will be his word. And this imagery for us, the sword that's there, it's not some little sword because there's a difference in the language. It is a broad sword. It's a big sword. It's one you need two hands to wield. That this is who Jesus is. He's God's champion. He's a mighty warrior. To be a Christian, as we see throughout Ephesians, is to be in Christ. It is to be clothed in Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Ephesians lays this out so substantially. What does this mean then to be baptized into Christ? It tells us, so many things. I'm going to just start at the beginning of Ephesians in one one. It says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Fifteen more times in Ephesians, it talks about how being in Christ has benefits. It means to be chosen. It means to be adopted and forgiven. It means to receive an inheritance and to be sealed with the Holy Spirit and have victory over your spiritual foes. And that's just chapter one. It goes on to say, to be in Christ is to be seated in the heavenlies. It means to be united with each other. It means to have access to the throne of God, to be sons and daughters of God, to be members of the body of Christ, to be clothed with the new self, the new man. It means to walk in God's love and forgive one another. It means to be awakened and enlightened in his word. And it means to be united with Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. And so when Paul comes here into chapter 6, and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord, well, I think this is what he's talking about. He's talking about what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to have been baptized into Christ? What does it mean to be a part of this church? It means to have Christ on, including his armor The armor of Christ is the armor of the Christian. So what is this armor? It tells us very clearly it's truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of God. These are gifts to those who are in Christ. This is the armor of the Christian because this is the armor of God. And this armor is yours for your security and for your assurance of victory in the midst of battle. So first, we're to be made strong. Second, we are to take up the armor of God, which simply means to believe God and his word. And third, we are to stand firm. The opposite of stand is not flying away, like to run away. That's an important thing for us to think about. The opposite of stand is to fall. The idea to stand firm is defensive. And the physical armor that Paul uses to describe those gifts that God has given to us, 
they are all defensive. And I think as we look at this, we'll see that very clearly. The Christian is called to stand against the lies and the schemes of the devil. As any good coach in a sport will tell you, just because you're on defense doesn't mean you get to take a break. In fact, defense is twice or three times as much work as offense. At least that's what I tell my, my soccer teams, too. This work on defense is accomplished by repeatedly taking up God's promises and believing in them. That's what we're to do. How do we stand? How do we take up God's armor? It's accomplished by repeatedly taking up God's promises and believing in them over and over again. Paul would have been familiar enough with the typical battle armor of a Roman soldier. He spent lots of time around them. As a young boy, they would have been going through his hometown because Palestine, the Roman province where Israel once was and the modern state of Israel is now, was dominated by Rome. Roman soldiers were everywhere. They're ubiquitous. But not only that, he spent a lot of time with Roman soldiers when he was on a boat with them on his way to Rome. He was arrested by them multiple times, both in Rome under house arrest and as he was a missionary throughout the Mediterranean. He had lots of time to consider their armor. And in fact, as we see at the bottom of chapter six, that he was in chains at this time. So as he's writing this letter, all he has to do is look up and he can look at the armor of the Roman soldier. So it's familiar to him, and this armor is all around him. This physical armor that he describes, I mentioned, is all defensive. The belt of armor is there to protect your midsection. It's not an inch and a half belt like what I'm wearing. This would have been a large armored belt. It would have protected him and made him firm to give them the strength and the power to be able to stand together. Roman soldiers don't fight alone. We all like the movie Gladiator, right? Or at least if you've seen it, it's been a while ago. The kids probably haven't seen it. But in Gladiator, it's this imagery of, of this one uh, soldier standing against another in, in this gladiatorial games. And that's not what Roman wars were like. That's what, how Romans fought. They stood in formation together. They were a rank upon rank next to one another. And so they would use their armor to the best of their ability to fight. And so the armor of the, of the belt would have protected their midsection. The breastplate would have protected their shoulders and upper body. The sturdiness of their shoes was important so that way they could maneuver together and stay in formation. Because when the formation breaks down, you lose the battle. And you're broken and you have to flee. And so those shoes are important for good footing as the armies run up against you. The shield was there to protect them against that army's onslaught and rush and against the arrows that they would have shot and spears and maces. The helmet would have protected their noggins, their melons, just like a bike helmet, right? It would have protected them and it would have kept them safe from that type of an injury. It's interesting to note here about the sword. And I think this is probably the thing that was most illuminating to me as I prepared for this sermon that the sword that's here, that's described, is not the same type of sword that's described of Jesus in Revelation. That the sword that's here is is a short sword. It's a dagger. It's the type of sword that you would have used if you were a guard in the temple. It's the type of sword that those guards in the temple used when they came out on Monday, Thursday, to arrest Jesus. It's, It's not big. It's defensive. And so you think of this Roman soldier standing in formation with a shield lock as their sh- tall shields that went from below their knee to up to, their, up to their, their chin. And they would have had these swords here. And when the other armies were coming and rushing against them, you can't have this big two-handed sword. You have a smaller one so you can throw it underneath or you can throw it around the side. The sword is defensive. That's the point. It's not one that you charge into battle with. It's one that you stand fast with. This sword is important, though, because this is your defense. This is how you hit back. This is how we answer to the lies and deceptions of the devil, wielding the word of God. So what are we to understand from the defensiveness of the armor of God that he has given to his people And our order for battle. How can you win a battle if you don't go on the offensive? 
Well, when the Lord was leading Israel out of Egypt, remember how Pharaoh's army chased after them? Remember how quickly the people were terrified when they saw Pharaoh coming? And what did Moses say? I'm going to read it for you from Exodus 14, verses 13 through 14. Moses said this to the people who were terrified. He says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. Be silent. Be still. And behold, the Lord our God, who is already seated on the throne, who has already won the battle, he has fought for you and he has won. Satan is defeated at the cross. Jesus Christ is has won your salvation and he has won the battle that rages on even now around us. Jesus Christ is the commander of the Lord's army and he is the one who has won the victory. He is the one who goes on the offensive for us. And he has indeed won. And so our call in this day and in this age while his victory is revealed is to stand fast in defiance against Satan and his host, trusting in the victory that has already been won, the victory over the forces of darkness, the victory over the devil and all of his hosts. So as a church, we can come together and stand fast and sing praises, knowing that Jesus has won our victory. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in him. Amen.